At Art and Design, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the lands of Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Muskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These nations were forcibly, forcefully removed from their traditional territories, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As part of a land-grant institution, we have a particular ob obligation to recognize the peoples of these lands and the histories of dispossession upon which the university rests. In keeping with the spirit of land acknowledgement statements, we also recognize these history, that these histories are both shared with and distinct from those of African Americans, Latine, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islander communities, among others. As artists and, human and humanists, we recognize that the past is not past, and that no field or arena of inquiry is ex exempt from the responsibility of addressing these le the legacies of settler colonialism, enslavement, and their contemporary manifestations well beyond acknowledgments such as this. Thus, this statement is a demonstration of our ongoing commitment to supporting the work of indigenous scholars and communities. It is also a reminder of how accounting for indigenous erasure and survivance makes visible the urgency of imagining change as collaboratively and collectively as possible. Let us then together envision what Muskogee Creek Cherokee poet Jay Harrell calls a map to the next world. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for a talk with Dr. Kelly Morgan presented as part of Black on Black on Black on Black lecture series. I'd like to further thank the School of Art and Design, Visitors Committee, the Cranor Art Museum, Francis P. Rowland's Visitor Artist Fund, the College of Fine and Applied Arts, and the Illinois Arts Council for your continued support. Dr. Kelly Morgan is a professor of practice and the inaugural director of curatorial studies at Tufts University, a curator, educator, and social justice activist who specializes in American art and visual culture, her scholarly commitment to the invest investigation of anti-blackness within those fields has demonstrated how traditional art history and museum practices work specifically to uphold white supremacy. Dr. Morgan earned her PhD in Afro-American studies and a graduate certificate in public history museum studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Besides her own curatorial experience, Dr. Morgan mentors emerging curators and regularly trains staff at various museums to foster anti-racist approaches in, collecting, in collection building, exhibitions, community engagement, and fundraising. Over the past year, Dr. Morgan has become a leading and influential voice in bolstering anti-racist work in art museums. She has held curatorial positions at the Indianapolis Art Museum at Newfields, the Birmingham Museum of Art, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and teaching positions at Wayne State University, the University of Michigan, and the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Please help me thank and welcome Dr. Kelly Morgan. Turn on the mic. I was like, there's processes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. there we go. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for having me. I have to thank you and your colleagues in the Department of Art and Design um, and the Credit Art Museum and all of you to be here on a Thursday before spring break because I will be out. Right? <laughs> um, it's a really good, this is like a really good moment for me um, because this project is, is kind of like a culmination of the work I've been doing my entire career. Like I can kind of, I was telling Patrick this earlier, like I can kind of narrate it now in hindsight and like see all the pieces, right? But as I was going through it, I was like kind of just doing what I needed to do, right? <laughs> to get through it. Um, but part of this also comes from a space of, just frustration, you know, with the field, you know, at this point, art museums, you know, universities, academic institutions, because we are constantly talking about the problem or like the symptoms, you know, because nobody likes to really talk about the root disease, right? Um, so this may be hard, you know, for some of you to hear, because I don't pull no punches about it. Um, part of my work, you know, as a curator and as a historian, 
um, is um, like where the field just kind of expected me to be the expert in like black contemporary art, right? Or like the expert in African-American art history. I'm actually an expert in whiteness and the functionality of white supremacy, right? <laughs> so when I show up and I'm not necessarily talking about Titus Kafar, right? Or Kara Walker um, or Kahende Wiley um, and talking about these issues. It's like, no, I'm talking about, you know, Gilbert Stewart and the Medici family, right? <laughs> and John Singleton Copley um, and just, you know, whiteness as a system. Um, it's really uncomfortable, you know, for people. Um, but it's really how we all got here. Um, so I'll start by saying like as expectations, right, regarding the social responsibility for art museums change, um, the imperativeness, is that a word? I don't even know. But like <laughs> the importance of understanding the colonial foundations of the museum field have never been more um, pressing. And recent studies, you know, show, Mellon's done studies, right? Ford has done studies that despite the diversity, right, that's happening, equity is not actually manifesting itself, right, within institutions. So I'm always like, of course it's not. <laughs> because you can't just, like, bring in the brown people and expect white supremacy to just magically go away, you know? Um systemic is beyond <laughs> a descriptor, you know, for it. So part of what I think, you know, it's really the essential difficulty is the fact that the vast majority of art museum leaders, right, art museum professionals across the board have a very limited training, right, in how to identify and how to address the contemporary manifestations of colonialism in the art museum. So I like to say that I frequently came into the field, both art history and the curatorial profession in general, like through the back door, right? When nobody was looking. Um, it was like I came in through the service entrance um, and got intimately acquainted, right? With the institutions, colonial, and the field, I think as a whole too, like colonial mechanisms um, and foundations. Um, well before I knew like what the galleries even looked like, it was like, oh, the workings of like how rotten, right? The foundation is. So from there, I really pride myself on doing the best I can, you know, to employ curatorial approaches that'll force institutions to change or create new infrastructures, but not necessarily because they want to. Right. Because I create the environments. I try very deliberately to create create environments that they don't have a choice. Right. I call it like scalpel work. Well, sometimes I call it the blast work, but sometimes you'll hear me refer to it as like being a surgeon um, where the work is so sharp. Right. By the time the institution is like figured out that it has to respond to it, it's already bled out. Right. So you have to be you have to kind of work in front of it. So a lot of this comes from the fact I'm from Detroit, right? so a lot of it has to do with being a Detroiter. Um, the other two aspects of it is um, being raised through black working class, grassroots black labor um, movement and black feminist frameworks. So like it's, since I was like knee high to a duck, I was trained how to and taught how to reared how to like use my positionality, right? And my being as a disruption. So... I didn't get that story of like, you got to um, work twice as hard, right? To get half as much. My grandfather was always like, they ain't no better than you. They ain't no smarter than you. <laughs> Whatever room you show up in is the room that you deserve to be in. Don't let nobody tell you that you, and my mother would say, that you don't know what you know what you know. Um, and growing up in Detroit, as a, like a really black city, like I grew up in the 80s, super black city. So I was always like, we never see any white people, you know, <laughs> like, like, why is this? I don't like, okay, granddaddy, but whatever. Um, and I start curating, right? I come into the museum field. I'm like, oh, this is why. Cause there's an entire expectation. Um, and I did not, I just wasn't, you know, reared like that. And it was like coming into institutions using my own cultural and personal biographies as like a valid form of knowledge. Um, was like super shocking for people. 
<laughs> you know, and really problematic for folks. And over time, like I learned as much as I was doing it, traditional institutions were never going to like support this work. But I also knew, you know, curators who were doing it, right? I knew scholars, you know, who were implementing it. Um, I knew activists, right, who were doing it. Um, and I knew artists, right, who were doing it. I'll tell you who these women are in a minute. Um, I also knew that there were so many, not just black women and men, right, but BIPOC women and men who had left us, like, instruction manuals that date back to at least the 1770s. So I was like, okay, mm, the roadmaps are there. Nobody's actually using them though, right? So there was like, you know, investigation. Um, from that, you know, I also started to experience the vast majority of museum professionals who actually wanted to learn, right? Both BIPOC and white. So I created a graduate certificate <laughs> program last week, last um, year to do so. I'm gonna go back really quick. So. I don't know. Can you guys see my? Yeah. So this is Kalolo Luckett. Um, she's a curator based in Pittsburgh. She runs the Alma Lewis. Um, it's like a contemporary art like platform that's dedicated, you know, to in black culture um, exclusively. This is Portia Moore. You know, she is the she's an assistant professor at the University of Florida, um, primarily spearheading their museum studies program. Um, this is Latanya Autry. Autry, some of you may actually know. Latanya, um, you know, curator activist. She's the co-founder of the Museums Are Not Neutral campaign. And then this is um, Xavier Simmons, um, really renowned black contemporary artist. And she has a show. I don't know if it's still open, but she has a show up right now at the Queens Art Museum called Crisis Makes a Book Club. And it's all about how, you know, instead of actually addressing issues of, you know, racial inequity, um, that a lot of times white institutions just start a book club, right? Like we're just going to read white fragility you know? <laughs> or we're going to read how not to be anti-racist while people are like dying um, out in the streets. And like the ludicrousity of that for her, um, the show is like a mid-career retrospective, but it actually goes into that reality too. Okay, so created this curriculum last year and it really walks museum professionals through how to apply like anti-racist frameworks to their basic job functions. But I also realized like after the first semester of teaching, I was like, before I can actually like teach people how to do it, I have to walk people through how like a process of unlearning. Right. So like unlearning the traditions of our history, right? <laughs> right. Unlearning some of the traditions um, of museum studies so that my students who are primarily museum work in museum professionals can get why you would need to know how to apply anti-racist frameworks to your basic job functions in the first place, right? Because the idea was, oh, the mission statement says, you know, post George Floyd, you know, our solidarity statement says, you know, <laughs> um, but then going into like, very real experiences where they try to actually implement something, right? And nothing happens, right? Or the wave crests, right? So now leadership isn't necessarily interested. And I was like, a part of the reason why that happens is because we as a field are not trained or knowledgeable in how the art museum do, like grew, you know, from colonization, like grew as a, a very real extension to colonization. Let me get my cord, because that would suck. Like, <laughs> I tried to charge it, oops, sorry, before I um, got here, but not enough, guess not enough time. Okay, give me like two seconds. Uh, outlet? Hey, uh, um, is there one up there? Oh, here it is. Oh, it's a power cord. Sorry, everybody, thank you. Okay, so from, like, or ideas as early as the divine right of kings, you know, to the enlightenment. I'm going to kind of skip back and forth a little bit. 
these particular ideas have been used to justify right, European empire and its literal recategorization of the world. And I'm going to walk us through like a little bit like how this happens. So the divine right of kings comes, it was really crafted, right, Middle Ages. So I'm going to read, usually I don't read my slides, but I'm going to do it today. So it says the divine right is the notion that royalty is given divine sanction to rule. But in the words of England's King James I, he says, quote, the state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth, right? State sanction, right? Not the individual. Sound familiar? <laughs> For kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself, they are called gods. Now, this is like a super skewed <laughs> interpretation um, of like kingdom dominion, you know, in Christianity. But if you actually believe this and then it's set in law, right? So it like rules the nation state. You have a God complex that is un freaking believable right <laughs> right okay so we have that fast forward 100 years the enlightenment begins to kind of rule intellectual thinking um this is Immanuel Kant if you study theory in any kind of way you run into this dude right <laughs> and I want to like highlight I'm not going to read this whole passage but the reason why the Enlightenment is really interesting is because we talk about Enlightenment as a moment of like innovation, right? So the moment that the, the modern world sort of dawns itself, not untrue, but while those things are being constructed, so is race, right? What history doesn't typically tell you, unless you're studying it from a black studies or a whiteness studies point of view, is the Enlightenment period also becomes the moment where whiteness is constructed, like, very literally in physics, anthropology, art history, right? The academic disciplines. So Kant is writing in um, 1764, the Negroes of Africa have by, by nature no feeling which rises above the trifling. Mr. Hume, meaning David Hume's, challenges everybody to produce a single example where a Negro has shown talents and maintains that among 100,000 blacks who are transported from their native home, though many of them are emancipated, not a single one of them has ever been found that has performed anything great, either in the arts or sciences. So, okay, Mr. Emmanuel Kant. <laughs> It's like, what do you actually know, right, about African people? Um, and I use Phyllis Wheatley as an, as an example um, because her book comes out basically 10 years after he writes this. So Phyllis Wheatley is often kind of posited, you know, and thought of as like this genius um, discovery, right, by the Wheatley family. Um, I say to people, you know, again, very frequently, like all the time, you can remove people from a land. Very hard to remove people from their memories, right? Wheatley was in, you know, captured and enslaved when she was about eight. So she gets to the States. Um, John Wheatley, who's her, you know, slave owner, his wife teaches her um, Greek and Latin. So by the time she's 12, she's speaking fluent Greek and Latin. Not because she was just so happy to, to please Mr. and Mrs. Wheatley. Think about the type of things that she was doing in her actual home space. Think about the people, you know, who were affirming her, who were teaching her, <laughs> right? Um, well before, right, she's kidnapped. So this isn't something that's like new to her. You see what I'm saying? And so when you're coming at it from a space, oops, from Kant, right? When you're actually looking to debase, when you're looking to pathologize, you can't even think of somebody like Wheatley prior to who you and what you need them to be to understand yourself. 
right? So what I'm constantly saying, teaching and talking, <laughs> you know, about all the time is when we look at the modern world and we talk about, you know, and I'll get to this in a minute, but like indigenous um, genocide, transatlantic slavery, slavery, and what it was, what was done to people in the subordination, again, like pathologizing us. Yes, but it wasn't being done simply because Europeans thought that we were savages, right? Or thought that our ancestors were just, you know, kind of out of this world. Um, it was because they couldn't see themselves, right? It was needing to establish a taxonomy that allowed them to understand where they fit in a world that was so much bigger than what they knew prior to New World and West African discovery, right? <laughs> so the Portuguese aren't traveling or circumnavigating the globe because it was just a fun thing to do. They were trying to figure out how North Africans were importing Japanese textiles, right, into European, into Southern Europe. They're trying to eliminate the middlemen, but they were also trying to figure out the trade routes. The British were super late to the game, um, but the Portuguese and the Spanish were like, how the hell are they, why do we have to pay? We gotta go down there and see what's happening. That kind of thing. So. With all of that going on, like I said, we know the horrors of African enslavement and, in, 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 and indigenous genocide. The other part of this equation that we don't often talk about a lot is in the wake of both of those events, as you know, as long as they were, European colonizers also amassed a massive number of BIPOC cultural objects which they subsequently built establishments to house and an economic market to support. So many of these objects made their way into European wonder commerce or what you may hear more commonly referred to as cabinets of curiosity. However, these motley private collections were not simply fascinating amalgams comprised by inquisitive <laughs> European explorers. Most significantly, they were skewed collections of the world, right? Assembled as representations of European power to possess it. So minerals, right? Botanicals, cultural objects, including bodies, right? Um, again, to understand their sense and to locate themselves, um, in the midst you know, of this world that was becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger than Europe itself. So we know colonization fueled this activity, right? Being both sanctioned and financed by the Catholic church and various U European nations. So what do we know about art history in, in Italy? I'm not asking that rhetorically. I'm actually like asking somebody to answer that. I said, what do we know about Italy and art history? Um, money, power. Mm -hmm. There's a very particular moment, that ha thing, that happens in Italy that is literally foundational to the study of art history. Yes. Right? <laughs> so how do we, like, how do we think that happens? So anybody familiar with the Medici dynasty? Mm -hmm. So they were a banking family, right? Um, they financed Spanish and Portuguese colonization. Then, through the money, right, that they make, develop a collecting practice um, that births in a, in, a, in a patronage structure, right, that really births the Italian Renaissance. Guess what? It's the exact same funding and patronage structure that we continue to use in traditional art museums today. The exact same structure, right? All right. Then we have our, our good little friend Napoleon here. So when we talk about colonization, which we should, we think a lot about, you know, indigenous nations in the Americas, um, Aboriginal nations, you know, in Australia, right? African nations on the continent. Napoleon worth colonizing Eastern European nations, right? 
So during the Nepo- Napoleonic Wars, he's actually stealing, <laughs> right, major art objects from other European countries to boast the, um, the Louvre's collections. You know, and I recall this happening again about 100 years later by another guy who was very adamant about colonizing the Western world. But we never talk about World War II in that way either, do we? Right? I think who stands out the most is King Leopold II in the Congo because he decimates the Congolese, right, to build this institution, which is the Royal Museum, um, the Royal African Museum for the Congo. Um, I do a very different thing when I talk about these things. Um, I don't put black bodies in pain on display, right? I put the thing that those, that that pain produced. Because we have to learn how to look at this stuff for what it actually is, right? Instead of what we're so used to seeing. So we know that this happens. Um, with this self-proclaimed illegal so-called divine right, right, Europeans kind of go around the world right, decimating by nations. Does anybody know the percentage of African cultural heritage that resides in Western institutions? Can anybody just guess? Ninety five percent. So think about this. Everything that was made, just like try to fathom this for me for like two seconds. From like 500 BC, even a little bit older than that, to 1930. How many centuries is that? It's at least 15 centuries. So think about the people who have lived, just the, just the sheer amount of people, right, who have lived over 15 centuries. So you can think about the sheer amount of things, right, that they've made, they produced, that they've passed down. Think about the sheer amount of stuff that's just in your bathroom cabinet right now. <laughs> 95% of that, a percent of those objects reside currently in Western art museums. So not only... Do you steal all the land, practically, because we are magical, so we didn't technically die, but you practically kill all the people, and then you literally take all the stuff. Clearly, you ain't trying to prove nothing about who we are, because you know that. Because if you didn't know that, you would need 95% of the cultural objects of a continent of people, and that's just one. We're not talking about the other four. Held in cages in the basement of institutions that look like this. Clearly you are trying to prove something about yourself to yourself. Whiteness is a psychosis, right? It is a normalized psychosis. And until we actually start thinking about that in that way, we will constantly be like on this, what I call a never ending hamster wheel. Um, it's also a built in conflict of interest. You have to take my class to get into that a little bit more, <laughs> right? But with all of this stuff and this history, the Wonder Camera becomes the primary model, right? For the modern art museum. And what that really, means, right, in, in sort of a broader sense, is that traditional art museums and the art market itself substantiates this racialized visual taxonomy that literally we reordered the world to construct and maintain whiteness specifically as a system of social, economic, and political power. So herein lies the fundamental reason why representation alone will not create structural change within art museums. Art museums developed from a Eurocentric notion of world ownership and domination. And excuse my French, but it ain't shit equitable about empire and, and world domination, you know? So the desire, right, for representation isn't something that's just unique to BIPOC. In fact, 
The art museum developed as a colonial space where Euro descended peoples exclusively represented themselves. Right? So the national, so natural history museums, ethnographic museums, botanical gardens, right, zoos, like the entire museum complex exist as extensions of the wonder comma, right? So there's spaces where European monarchs, aristocrats, scholars, right, scientists are displaying who and what they can do with the world and everything and everybody in it. So then art museums emerge as the, again, exclusive space where they represent their sense of self within that world. Right, so two on that. So the ubiquity, right, of white representation within all modern systems is the very reason why white people have benefited the most from them. Representation for white folks works within art institutions in a way that it doesn't work for BIPOC folks because white representation and middle-class mores are literally inherent to every aspect of dominant society's functionality. BIPOC cultural mores, right, our ways of knowing, <laughs> you know, our ways of being in the world are not. In fact, BIPOC representation alone seldom results in structural change in any institution for that, not just art, art museums, because pathologizing, fetishizing, and in some cases, literally illegalizing, right? Our way of being is central and essential to colonial systems. So if you know anything about Afro-pessimism as a theory, right, the idea is whiteness thrives because, blackness, because of black death, right? So white systems can't exist without black and brown death. Um, it's really morbid, <laughs> right? But to a certain degree, it's like whiteness as a system is this like, uh, like this death machine, right? It perpetuates it. So to give you an example, I want you to think about something for a little bit. All right. How often do you see in traditional art museums, encyclopedic art museums, the engagement of BIPOC work in our own ways of knowing? I'm going to see slow. How often are traditions, practices, or aesthetic values of BIPOC cultures being responsibly, carefully, and deliberately applied to BIPOC artwork? Do you think the field has even recognized that art museums frequently employ a quintessential colonial practice when attempting to address the systemic nature of racism within their institutional cultures? Anybody know? Can you guess what that colonial practice is? BIPOC artwork or BIPOC people are put on display in ways that are inherently extractive. Goes a little something like this. Whenever an institution realizes that it's in a DI crisis, right? <laughs> Usually only after a black employee or visitor has been harmed, right? Excuse my French again, the shit never happens before, some, before something happens to somebody. Almost like clockwork, the black contemporary artist is commissioned, right? to perform the intervention in the permanent galleries, you know, commission, you know, so we're going to put this piece, um, you know, on, <laughs> on view. Or 30 Americans is immediately added to the exhibition calendar, right? <laughs> um, and the artist is typically asked to create a work or a group of works that in some kind of idealistic but ultimately temporary fashion <laughs> It's supposed to cleanse the institution of its unbelievably racist and sexist history. The usual, right, but incorrect assumption is this by simply being in the colonial space as a BIPOC person and making work in response to it, the artist can repair or, ab or absolve, right, the institution from taking any kind of responsibility for the harm that's been afflicted. 
So this physical and aesthetic extraction from the artist usually results in a temporary socio-political visibility for guess who? Most often the white leadership of the institution or the institution itself. Primarily the director. Who then, and I want y'all to research this, uses the facilitation of the project to garner a higher paying job. Right, because, not, because the culture of silence and fear in the art world is what it is. Um, I ain't gonna say no names, but there are three major white directors of institutions right now who have gotten the jobs that they have after facilitation of a major black contemporary artist acquisition, right? or after saying, you gonna know who this is, after saying, we're gonna dedicate five, the next five years to collecting work by only women artists and only black artists. So like I said, look that up. <laughs> because contrarily, these commissions never engender a redistribution of wealth and resources for BIPOC communities. Right. Hardly ever do they leave better working conditions for BIPOC staff if there are BIPOC staff right at the institution. To add insult to injury, sometimes, depending on where the artist is in their career, the artist isn't even compensated monetarily. It's like, oh, it's exposure. Right. Because we're the Whitney. You know, it's really great exposure because we're the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Um, as if you can eat on exposure, right? <laughs> in graduate school, I was always so confused, right, that Fred Wilson's mind in the museum never really shifted curatorial practice, like, um, permanently, because he left a roadmap, like, very literally, <laughs> right? He left an instruction manual. So in my mind, I was like, the curation of historical collections should never happen in the business as usual way ever again, because he's been doing this since 1993. Right. Um, but unbeknownst to me, nobody applied. And you can even see that now. It's like, oh, it's 20 years after mine in the museum. We gonna have Fred Wilson. And then, like they never actually talk about what he did. You know, it's like this commodification of the exhibition itself. Um, and they didn't apply it because they they didn't have to. Oh. Right. Right. They've never had to. You know, I do these lectures or like I said, I teach these seminars and trainings and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm constantly saying, you know, to white Americans across the world, like you've never had to, you've never had to unpack whiteness like this before in your life. You know, and I was like, and we come into the world learning how to navigate it. You know, another example that I like to use or analogy is I say, you know, in 2008, white conservatives had a complete and utter nervous breakdown <laughs> right in 2016 white liberals had the exact fucking nervous breakdown but for the exact but for the exact opposite reason this white thing is white people's issue because if if work by by pop people could change it i would not be standing here right now we have literally been doing it asians Native Americans, black people, Latinx folks for generations. And y'all are here on a Thursday before spring break, right? <laughs> Listen to me talk about it, right? Even more. So at some point we actually have to start talking about whiteness. Like we actually have to name it. Um, and we have to name like what it is is right what is doing how it exists you know as a system um i'll give you another example about like how this manifests itself so over the last eight years you know i've realized how excellent like despite how excellent the bipoc work is how much the artist works to ensure right that the work produces um tangible right? Effects, results, resources, benefits, 
um, for BIPOC staff and communities. The piece inevitably be, in, inevitably right becomes a vessel for white financial and cultural capital because art museums are colonial repositories that will power specifically through, get this, the acquisition of objects, right? So you can't do, you can't make the work. Representation is key, like it needs to be there, but the work itself, just being in the collection, is not gonna change the problem. So think about this, all the performative solidarity statements that were posted in 2020, after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, right? They weren't tone deaf simply because museums rushed to virtue signal. Principally, the virtue signaling itself is a contemporary manifestation of the museum's colonial functionality. Displaying BIPOC work specifically to extract the artist's identity and the work's cultural relevance as a demonstration of this convenient social awareness. So again, like these statements didn't actually require the institutions to do any real work, right, in solidarity with BIPOC communities because in colonialist terms, acquisition, virtue signaling, extraction, I hate when that happens. I was like, that was gonna be good. <laughs> I gotta stop using my phone. Um, yes, but that acquisition, ownership, extraction, display, the virtue signaling and the erasure is the work, right? So this is why there was no forethought, right? By some museums even asked for the permission. So this is why like the Met is apologizing to Glenn, Ly to Glenn Ligon, right? After Glenn is like, if you gonna do it, Right, you're gonna put some respect on my name, <laughs> you know? Um, and there's, there's no real thought about it. This is never really about true solidarity with black communities. Because me, our museums has never had to be, right, in solidarity with BIPOC communities. It was about using black art and artists to not appear complicit in a settler colonial society that allows for the murder of individuals like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. You know, we as BIPOC folks, we know very well, you know, institutions aren't in solidarity, right, with our communities and our families. Um, like, we don't need the solidarity statement. You know, even the land acknowledgement, I've been pushing back on people. Like, did somebody ask you to do a land acknowledgement? Because I know Native nations have been asking for some very specific things <laughs> for decades. And I don't remember land acknowledgement being nowhere right, on that list. <laughs> Correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, right? But I was like, I could have swore they was asking for their ancestors back, right? I could have swore they were asking for their things, right? <laughs> right, that you stole, I don't know, like how many, how many decades ago. So despite, right, these solidarity statements, we two and a half years later, Tyree Nichols is murdered, right, a couple weeks ago. Anthony Lowe is murdered a couple of weeks ago. How many major art museums have created or operationalized or activated, right, their BIPOC works to benefit, soothe, or support black communities, black students, and black people now? This is one of those times where I like channel my fifth grade teacher, like I'll wait, right? Zero. So all your solidarity that you got on Instagram and on your web page and on your Facebook page, right? And you created your book clubs. We two years in and crickets because that's how whiteness works, right? It's performative. And to a certain degree, like Bell Hook says, white supremacy informs everything that we all think all the time, right? So you're constantly having to like reprogram yourself to divest from it. So again, this is why acquisition and exhibition is not enough to produce genuine equity. It's also why art museums have taken so long to even consistently acquire and exhibit BIPOC work in the first place. 
Although the aesthetic presence of BIPOC work in museums is indispensable, and I think it allows for a type of like purely visual um, appreciation, genuine equity won't develop in institutions. And so the multivalent cultural and aesthetic patterns of BIPOC work are fully incorporated into why the gallery or the museum space is there in the first place. So the work has to be activated through BIPOC epistemologies. Two things. When we're talking about colonization, right, there are BIPOC people who have unpacked this for us already, right? <laughs> right? W.E. Du Bois is one, and May Cezaire is another. And there are, there are other folks, France Fanon, right? Paulo Freire, um, the list you know, is, is, is long. Um, and what they really do, Du Bois and Cezaire, right, writing 30 years apart, is a writing about the colonialist like psyche, right? This psychosis that leads us to World War not one but not once but twice, right? And so they're saying we really have to deal with what whiteness actually means, right? Like how whiteness is actually functioning, what it actually results in. This tradition among BIPOC scholars. It's like over 300 years old, right? These are like two black male scholars, poets. You know, they were like Renaissance men, <laughs> you know, but you can find these scholars, you know, in, again, in indigenous histories, in Latinx histories, right? In Latin American histories, in Asian histories. We've been writing about this stuff forever. But how often are these ideas and these scholars and their work actually applied right, to museum practice, you know, not nearly enough. So I'm going to give you an example of how to do that. William Wetmore's story. The reason why I love to do this is because, like the Black feminists has, have told us, again, for decades, if you heal the margins, you can heal the center. The reason why BIPOC epistemology application to not just BIPOC work, but to museum practice could be helpful in this moment and we're trying to develop equity, it's because BIPOC epistemologies apply to works by white artists too, right? So I'm gonna show you how. So thinking with Du Bois's Souls of White Folks and this whole idea of like, but what on earth is whiteness? I like to unpack or reveal how story really constructed whiteness atop of black women's bodies, right? And Libyan Sybil is um, particularly suited for this because his conceptualization of the sculpture grew from his relationship with Harriet Beecher Stowe. Are y'all familiar with that name? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And their shared racialized misunderstanding of a phenomenal black woman known by the name of Sojourner Truth. So I created this digital installation um, to put Libby and Sybil in direct conversation um, with images, right, of material culture. So Stowe's really racist essay <laughs> that she writes about Sojourner Truth is called Sojourner Truth, the Libby and Sybil. Um, Sojourner Truth's actual photographs of herself, right, self-representations, stories on writings about the sculpture, and then other objects of Black women's self-representation. Now, the reason why this is important is because Truth was very clear about how she saw herself and who she felt like, who she saw herself to be as the internationally known abolitionist and feminist leader that she was. But despite that, Stowe's essay explains how this, her, her meaning Stowe, her literary depiction of truth directly influenced this story sculpture and what he perceives as Africa's like inherent demise, right? Which he writes to a lot of his friends about. So contrary to Stowe and Story's racist imagination, black women didn't see themselves, right? On the eve of the civil war 
as like destined or like doomed. Instead, they really saw the truth of who they were as people in the white racist narratives of folks like Stowe and Story. How do I know this? Because there are literally thousands of daguerreotypes, tintypes, ambertypes, cardivisites of black women and children and men in archives all across this country that say unidentified African-American woman, unidentified African-American man, hordes of them, dating from the time daguerreotyping becomes popular in the United States, which is like the mid 1850s, to the depression era. We utilized photography because we knew who we were, despite who the dominant culture said we were, right? So think about engaging these type of images, you know, when you go to see a work like this. <laughs> you know, when you know, when you have something, whether it's an app or a digital interactive, telling you, like this is the other thing about art history. You don't have to spend five years in the Getty Archive or the Smithsonian Archive of American Art, right? You can Google search William Wetmore Stories letters and all of this stuff that I am telling you will come up for you. None of this is like, um, I think the way I'm putting it together, I would say is original scholarship, but I am using primarily like primary resources and secondary scholarship. It's there. So at this point, this, this narrative, you know, that institutions will tout of we don't know, well, we don't know how, well, we don't know. It's like you don't know because you don't want to know. Most of the people in leadership position, well, maybe not, let me not say most, because we got some folks in leadership position where you're like, how the fuck you get the job, right? <laughs> but most people are graduate degreed, right? PhD, at least master's degree. So you should have some sense of like research. Maybe you don't know how to do research in the humanities, right, per se. But you, you know, you have been trained. <laughs> like it ain't rocket science. So I'll close by saying, you know, my friend Kajet Solomon, um, who's the museum SEI program specialist at RISD, she always says this, people comprise institutions, period. Which means that the art museum and its colonial foundations and discriminatory culture are not this haphazard byproduct of history. Rather, it is our conscious decisions that create that reality. Now, we have to become learned and respectful of, right, BIPOC ontologies and BIPOC epistemologies, specifically to center the BIPOC cultural experience and humanity. We also have to know how to analyze our institution's functionality for spaces of disruption to make room for that type of conscious decision, right? Ultimately, we have to decide to change the way we operate and your day-to-day -day activities. It ain't nothing different than saying, okay, I need to lose 30 pounds. So I can't order Grubhub and DoorDash no more for the rest of however, you know, many weeks. Right? I got it. I've been going to the gym, right? I got these 30 pounds off. I want to get 50 pounds off. Now I've kind of plateaued. Damn, I need to get a trainer. We make these split decisions to change stuff in our lives every freaking day. Anti-racism work is no different. And so it's like, we either, either going to decide to do it or we not. I'm a person that has just been doing it, <laughs> right, for eight years. Because I know how imperative it is. So we have to acknowledge that the history or the history itself, right, is comprised of an innumerable amount of experiences that are happening simultaneously. And I mean this when I say this. And now, right now, today, we all have to take responsibility for our institutions and our individual selves or roles 
in that history. Thank you. I totally didn't intend to talk the whole time. It always happens. But I feel like I owe y'all because I was not here when I first said I was supposed to be here. Um, so do we have time, Patrick, to do a couple of questions? Yeah, Okay. absolutely. People are curious. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I was really struck with um, in the folder we got of your lectures. Mm, mm -hmm. I come in the fall, you, you talked about how uh, call it revisionist interpretation mm -hmm. a lot of European histories, how we see a lot of gods and allegories uh, of prowess and beauty, and mm -hmm. you said that that was the way the Europeans imagined themselves, mm -hmm. so like that, that direct um, relation. I thought that was extremely insightful, and I mean, one, one sentence that really changes the entire perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and a long lineage yes. of, of art history. So my question is really has to do a little bit to the different time period okay. of a pre-1500. Okay. Period. And I'm really interested to know where you, because I, ca I come from Islamic studies, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I think of your work as a revisionist work, as a line that's already drawn. Mm -hmm of a continuum of your opinion. Mm -hmm. And so there's a moment where you're kind of shifting or changing the origin point. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the, and, and forgive me here, but one, one of the um, arguments against identity studies is that classics are classics for a reason because they have a very long lineage of time. And so I'm interested to hear where you would situate something, especially for students of art history. In my case, Islamic architecture, we don't have so many objects that are in the mm -hmm. We're studying things that are really happening in a different time period, mm -hmm. in a different sphere. Nonetheless, also, um, imperial, also mm -hmm. uh, representing patronage and mm -hmm. power. And because of that, they also need to be rethought about. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do you think of education today mm -hmm. as bringing together these different things, not as just a section integrating? Mm -hmm. it's a lot of, I feel like this is a temporality problem. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we're like, okay, so we're, we'll just deal with this chronologically. Yeah. Like there's these different things. Yeah. But in a more integrative way is how some of the work that you've done mm -hmm. can apply to different areas of study and different time periods. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to push back. That's your job. That's my job? That's not my job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? So partly because... I'm not trained as a traditional art historian, right? So I'm bringing a black studies, a very specific, you know, black studies framework to art history. Um, because I also work in, you know, I'm a practitioner, I'm a curator as well. For me, it made sense to start with the funding model, right? Because we're always talking about like, we can do all these initiatives as artists, as curators, as museum professionals. Ends of the day, it's a trustee issue, right? <laughs> right? It's a board issue. Um, and so I was like, what is the history of that model, right? So that was kind of how I came in, came into it. The other thing that I'll push back on, right, in a Western sense of thinking, right, that's the idea. Like, what is the linear story? It's never been linear, right? That either or binary <laughs> is the thing that we have to unlearn. And Black studies... To kind of Barrique studies, Latinx studies, right? I think even women in queer studies um, shakes us out of that linear thinking, right? Because you do come to see that there's an entire other history of the world that predates Europe, that predates the classics, <laughs> you know? So I wasn't trained, right, in that traditional way. Um, 
And because I think that enlightenment structure, particularly when it comes to art and art history, established itself from its own racist imaginary of everybody else in the world, it's invalid for me. Like, I don't care, right? <laughs> like what the classics or like what art history, what anthropology has said. Like scientifically, yeah, there's some things. But because it was specifically there, you know, to establish this hierarchy of power and hegemony, right? And all of the sort of things, um, I specifically eschew it. Um, you know, I, it's incorrect, right? It's an incorrect model, but it's the normalized model. And so that's why I'm constantly like doing it that way. The other thing is like, because I'm bringing, this is the last thing I'll say, um, you know, just in case there's other, another question, but like the idea that because I'm doing something different now, I'm supposed to have all the answers for everybody, right? I am literally pushing back against 700 years, right? And as you like really demonstrate, like even more, more than that, um, that too, you know, is a sense of white privilege, you know, it's like, oh, you're doing a new thing. So like, and not, I'm not, this is not something that I'm like directing specifically at you, but I get these questions all the time, right? Right. And so I try to like um, illustrate, you know, the privileged way in which we've normalized like a white centered or a white hegemonic thinking, right? That is often projected, right? At people of color. Like when we're coming at this stuff, you know, from our own cultural, right? Um, historical locations, right, of positionalities. So in, like if I were in your shoes, that would have been the question that I would have wrote down for myself and then went home and tried to figure out because I am an expert in Islamic, right, art history, you know, because I have a specialization in this time period. So maybe Saturday. Right. Right. Or maybe not like literally Saturday, but it's like, you know, at, at some point, you know, I'm going to take the, you know, the notes, the experience and say, OK, how does what I know and what I've been trained about this particular area, right, or era of our history relate to what Kelly presented on Thursday? Like, how can I find right that connection point? Does it connect? Right. It may not, you know, too, because we can get down the rabbit holes. Right. And there's no like and the archive doesn't always provide us those things either. Right. So this is the way that like I try to like illustrate in the moment, you know, to say, um, you know, not just to you or like, you know, singling you out, but just like to everybody. Like this is the way you have to start thinking about this stuff. Because I didn't say I didn't sit in, you know, our history 101 and like say to my teacher, we're out of black people, right? I was like, damn, there are no black people. There's probably a reason for that. I'm gonna go figure out what that reason is, right? And once I figured it out, at least this little piece of it, then I was like, hey, everybody, here's why there's no black people. That's the work. Yep. Oh, no, they're so not. <laughs> so people ask me that all the time, too, right? And the answer is they're not. They cannot be redeemed. You know, like, so part of this project, like, came out today in Hyperallergic, right? And they changed the title of the piece. So it's like, how can, you know, art museums shake off their colonial legacy? And I was like, really? But I was like, but the art world gonna art, so whatever. So, like, it can't really be undone. It super can't. We got to start all over again. We, it may not even, we don't even need to call them museums, right? That's a whole nother lecture. But I do this work for those of us who have to be in them, right? They're not going anywhere anytime soon, right? Which sucks. But like, <laughs> but it's, I always tell people, and this is kind of defeating too, but it's like, we're not going to see these changes in our lifetime, 
right? Before the generation for the Gen Zers who are not having any of it, which I love Gen Z for that reason, they need the historical context, right? Because they are the generation who were systemically or systematically undereducated and miseducated purposely, right? So that this work couldn't actually happen in any, right, of our like cultural institutions or, you know, societal institutions. Um, so I do it for that reason. I'm exhausted, like, <laughs> like very literally. Um, and this is like, not, you know, TMI, but I'm very open, you know, about the effects of the trauma. So I was like, I was in New York two weeks ago. I had a complete and utter meltdown um, in Chelsea because I was triggered. <laughs> like, it's just, like, you can't unsee it, right, once you've seen it. Um, and I was standing on the corner of, like, 21st and 9th, like, screaming and crying. Um, like, okay, and, you know, calm down, got myself together. And I was like, therapist, <laughs> right? <laughs> got to call. Let me call Jamie because that was not okay, right? <laughs> but it's like, it's taking a toll, you know, on me at this point. Um, and I was saying to some folks, you know, or, or this morning, like, I've kind of hit a wall. You know, understand, like, what you're getting into, you know, what this work costs you because um, it costs a lot. Whether white, black, right, Asian, Latinx, queer, right, disabled, if you're going to take it on, um, it's a very dangerous, it's very dangerous work to do. I feel, you know, I feel the death threats, like, I've, it's, it's been some shit, right? <laughs> um, and if you follow me on Instagram, you know, I, I actually say that with the, um, the piece, you know, the, hyperallergic that came out yesterday. I was like, you know, this is a really emotional post for me because I have been drugged through the mud. You know, I've had to pick up and leave cities for doing this work. You know, I said, so getting it out, like here with you all today, as well as like it coming out in hyperallergic, um, it's like such a, like, I was really hoping I didn't start crying today, but, um, you know, it's like, it's really emotional. Because this work has been, like, literally, it's been my life, you know? And this is the part, this is also, also the reason why, like, I'm a problem for a lot of folks in the field. Because this is the part nobody tells you, right? This is the thing where they say, well, we, you know, museums can create new futures on old foundations, right? Like, how many times have we heard that, right? <laughs> right? This is, this... I don't represent Thelma Golden in the studio museum narrative, mm -hmm. right? I don't even represent the David Driscoll, right? HBCU, Howard, Fisk, Spellman narrative. I represent the reality of what's happening in terms of gender discrimination, class discrimination, sexual harassment, right? <laughs> you know, inaccessibility, gaslighting, narcissistic sociopathy, um, the, I always say I like kind of, uh, I work in the underbelly, <laughs> you know, other field. Um, and you're not going to get around it. You know, you're going to find different versions of the same thing, regardless of what institution you go to. I know it sucks, but it's the truth. And I'm just trying to save you that, you know, for when you get in and be like, what just happened? Like I tell my students all the time, what you think is happening to you is happening to you. You know, and if you have to go, that was weird. <laughs> Or I don't like, I don't know. That just felt, yeah, nine times out of 10, you know, that's the, the gaslighting and, and, the, and it's abusive. You know, it's abusive. I spend a lot of time shuffling my mentees, you know, and, and even some of my students, former students, into other jobs, you know, just around the field, you know, because there's kind of no safe space, you know. So I always say you have to get in and like get what you need because the field is structured the way that it is. So get the line on the CV, right? If it's something that you feel like you can learn, you know, from an institution's collection or how an institution is structured, get that thing and get out. You know, don't subject yourself to it longer than you have to be. Yeah. I am happy that I went third because it set an amazing platform for my questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I wasn't going to ask mine, but I think that, especially coming after the first question, it might be useful for other folks that mm -hmm. are here. So I'm coming from the African-American studies okay. background, um, not 
the museum uh-huh. um, background, but currently with two very tired people about two rows ahead. Oh, of yeah. Me, um, I am the, I'm a social impact and evaluation consultant okay. for a museum. Monica, love you. Thank you for telling me about this event. Um, but besides that, I wanted to figure out well, how in my work, mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to attack it from the kind of the Wildersonian angle you mm. brought up. Um, Afro okay. pessimism, mm-hmm. NATO alienation. Mm-hmm. I haven't necessarily been able to figure out how to work from that position or work from that scholarship in the museum. And I don't want you to tell me how, mm-hmm. as instead to more so and say in front of everybody, what the reading. Because I've mm-hmm. really thought, am I going to go to Moton? Do I need to read back in the Undercommons? Do I need to go? You bring up um, Fanon. Do I need to go over mm-hmm. there? But I just wanted to know if there's a scholarship that I can pick up that can perhaps, um, what specifically you're doing, a reinterpreting Africa project, but w- what do I need to pick mm-hmm. up? What do I need to read again? Kind of coming out of that afro pessimist okay. literature um, when kind of working to both mobilize as well as do evaluation work for mm-hmm. my own job as someone who's not necessarily in this camp. Yeah, those are the three. You know, they really would be. Okay. Um, something that I could say Actually, that's kind of, that is actually kind of practical for <laughs> for you. It's like, find the thing, you know, that you want to do, you know, whether it's pro- programmatic, whether it's like an actual, like, work of art. Um, and is it art museum or history museum? History. History. Okay. So you can find the object. Um, something that I used to do is I went back to, like... Frederick Douglass, Francis Harper, and like black abolitionists. So it was like, what was the what was the actual strategy? So, and I can send you some some text where they talk about that. I looked, I went back to Project C, you know, 63, Birmingham. I went back to um Black Panther Party, right? 10 point plan. And SNCC Freedom Summer, right? So it was like, how did they, even Montgomery Bus Boycott, like, uh, but not like, not the meta narrative. Um, Joanne Robinson, E.D. Dixon, right? And like what they were actually, how they were actually implementing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I went back to those, like, like I said, primary sources. Because I was like, okay, I know black folks have done this. Maybe not necessarily in an art museum, right? But they've done it in the in the wake or in the well in the in the face of not so much in the wake of like FBI, CIA, CIA right? Infiltration, um, state sanctioned violence, right? State sanctioned war, um, and so I studied particularly Project C and Freedom Summer, right? Because it was like that split where SNCC was like, okay, well SCLC, like y'all can go if y'all gonna go. But we're going to stay here in Lyles County. Like, we're going to stay here in Mississippi with these folks, and we're going to figure out a network. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's, you know, some of her works, her writings, like, talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, I can't think of anything that's been specifically, the specific application of Afro-pessimist theory. But my bestie is a sociologist who's, like, kind of quantitatively testing Afro-pessimism right now, so I'll ask her. Yeah, give me your information and I'll figure out if she knows anything. But, but yeah, but like those historical um, frameworks, you know, were super yeah. helpful to me. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love it. You. You're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Kelly, for